We want to take you now to Washington, D.C., where the funeral for the first female Secretary of State, Madeleine Albright, is underway. Let's listen. I am resurrection and I am life, says the Lord. Whoever has faith in me shall have life, even though she die. And everyone who has life and has committed herself to me in faith shall not die forever. As for me, I know that my Redeemer lives and at the last he shall stand upon the earth. After my awaking, he will raise me up, and in my body I shall see God. I myself shall see, and my eyes behold him who is my friend and not a stranger. For none of us has life in herself, and none becomes her own master when she dies. For if we have life, we are alive in the Lord, and if we die, we die in the Lord. So then, whether we live or die, we are the Lord's possession. Happy from now on are those who die in the Lord, for they rest from their labors. Good morning. My name is Randy Hollerith, and I'm the Dean of Washington National Cathedral. And on behalf of Mary Ann Buddy, the Episcopal Bishop of the Diocese of Washington, and the entire cathedral community, welcome. Welcome to this house of prayer for all people. It is an honor to host this service for Madeleine Albright. To Anne and Alice and Katie and the entire Albright family, our hearts are with you and with all those across our country and around the world who grieve the loss of this great American. Secretary Albright was a wonderful friend to this cathedral. Twice over, she served as a member of the chapter, the cathedral's governing board. She was a parent and a grandparent of students in the schools here on the close. And she was loved and admired by all who knew her. We say goodbye today to a remarkable human being. Madeline was a leader, mentor, trailblazer, reconciler, and patriot. She was a person of deep faith who always held firm to the highest ideals of her faith and her country. She has died, but she has not been lost. 
Madeline lives now in God, and she leaves all of us a legacy that will serve as a blessing for many, many years to come. Having fought the good fight and kept the faith, grant her, we beseech thee, dear God, the crown of life that fadeth not away. Amen. Freedom endures against all odds in the face of every aggressor, because there are always those who will fight for that freedom. And in the 20th and 21st century, freedom had no greater champion than Madeleine Corbel Albright, Anne, Alice, Katie. Your mom was a force, a force of nature. With her goodness and grace, her humanity and her intellect, she turned the tide of history. David, Daniel, Jack, Jake, Ben, and Ellie, you're too young to remember this, but when the Iron Curtain fell and the Berlin Wall came down, our world faced one of those inflection points, once-in-a-generation moment of upheaval but opportunity as well. People and nations around the world were deciding the future they wanted to make for themselves. And your grandmother, your grandmother, as a Madam Ambassador, 
and as the first female Secretary of State in American history, made sure those nations and those people knew exactly where the United States of America stood and what we stood for. You know, and all through it, her beloved sister Kathy and her brother John can attest, she never forgot where she came from or who she was. President Obama, President Secretary Clinton, Vice President Al Gore, members of Congress, cabinet members, past and present. Today, we honor a truly proud American who made all of us prouder to be Americans. I also want to welcome the distinguished guests and dignitaries who've traveled from around the world to celebrate a daughter of the Czech Republic who knew, who knew what it meant to endure war and flee persecution. With her friend, Vaclav Havel, when he died, I remember when Madeleine eulogized him, she used these words, and I quote, he cast light into places of deepest darkness and reminded us constantly of our obligations to one another. These words, these words apply equally to Madeline. When I got word that Madeline had passed, I was in midair on my way to Europe to meet with our NATO allies in Brussels to help try to continue to keep the the strong, strong alliances together. Our organization and the international response to Russia's brutal and unjustifiable war against Ukraine. It was not lost on me that Madeleine was a big part of the reason NATO was still strong and galvanized as it is today. And a few days later, I traveled to Poland and spoke about all that was at stake in our world and for democracy and freedom, which is under assault from forces of autocracy and oppression. Many are tired of hearing me say, I think we're at another inflection point in world history where there is literally a severe a confrontation between autocrats and democratic nations. President Clinton, Bill, it was not lost on me that you spoke at the same Warsaw Castle that I was about to speak at 25 years earlier. In my case, it was evening. The interior of the castle, a beautiful courtyard, holds about five, 600 people. And mostly Poles and Ukrainians were present when I spoke. And I'm sure men in the audience spoke English, though likely not their first language. But when I mentioned the name, they were respectful of what I was saying. But when I mentioned the name of Madeleine Albright, there was a deafening cheer. They all stopped everything. They started to cheer. It was spontaneous. It was real. For her name is still synonymous with America as a force for good in the world. Madeline never minced words or wasted time when she saw something needed fixing or someone who needed helping. She just got to work. And as a member of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee from the time I was a kid, God, they were the good old days. I, uh, I was the chairman or the ranking member for a good part of that time. And uh, in the 90s, I can attest that Madeline, with the significant help of the President of the United States, kept the committee really busy. And our work to halt 
genocide in the Balkans, support new democracies in Eastern and Central Europe, to develop Plan Colombia, and all those undertakings. Madeleine was an incomparable ally and advisor beyond the President to me and to others in the committee. She always had a knack for explaining to the American people why it mattered to them that people everywhere in the world were struggling to breathe free. And Madeleine didn't stop when she left government. For decades, she was a nexus of the foreign policy community, always, and I mean always, on top of the latest developments, always speaking out for democracy, and always the first to sound the alarm about fascism. Presidents and leaders around the world continue to solicit her advice, including me. When I asked her last year to chair the Defense Policy Board, she built businesses. She pumped out New York Times bestsellers <laughs> that were both highly prescient and deeply salient and constantly bestsellers. I think I've read them all. You know, and she, and she mentored generations of rising foreign policy experts, the, quote, foreign policy establishment. You know, and the thing that I noted that was deliberate and remarkable about her, not unlike Secretary Clinton, was that she made sure that young women knew they belonged at every single table having to do with national security, without exception. Today, across our government and around the world, Madeleine's protégés are legion. Many are here today, each carrying with them a spark lit by her passion and her brilliance. I think part of the reason why Madeleine was such a successful diplomat was that she understood something I've always believed and my boss, President Obama, when I was vice president, used to kid me because I repeat so often. Because I believed she understood something I've always believed, that all politics, especially international politics, is personal. And all ultimately is personal. She could go toe to toe with the toughest dictators, then turn around and literally teach a fellow ambassador how to do the Macarena on the floor of the UN Security Council. <laughs> you all think I'm kidding. I'm not kidding. She thought it was too difficult to teach me how to dance, though. She was right. No matter where she was, she understood people. She cared about people. And all of that was grounded in an education gained by watching her father, George, Joseph Corbel, and her mentor as well. She learned diplomacy at the dinner table. And throughout her life, nothing mattered to Madeline more than the family. Nothing. Madeline had the same role that I do and others here do. No matter what's happening in my day, as President Obama can tell you, or who I'm meeting with, if one of my children calls, I take the call. She was the same way. Anne, Alice, Katie, and your grandchildren, each of you, each of you is literally a tribute to her enormous, to her enormous capacity to love. I know it's hard, but I promise you, She's always with you, in your mind, in your heart, and part of your soul. And I promise you, you're going to have a tough decision. You're going to be asking yourself, what would she want me to do? Not a joke. Remember I said it. That's going to happen.
and Kathy and John, the connection the three of you maintained through your lives was always an anchor to Madeline through all the ups and downs of life. What a gift. What a gift. What a family. You know, from that first transatlantic crossing on the SS America, to landing in nations around the world in that big blue and white plane emblazoned with the words United States of America. Madeline understood her story was America's story. Her story was America's story. She loved to speak about America as the indispensable nation. To her, the phrase was never a statement of arrogance, it was about gratitude for all this country made possible for her. It was a testament to her belief in the endless possibilities that only America could help unlock around the world, and her true understanding of what America power could achieve when it was united with and motivated by enduring American values. That's why there was nothing she loved more than swearing in new citizens to this great nation of ours. She'd light up, reminding them that she once stood where they stood. Having gained the blessings of liberty, she wanted nothing more than to share them around the globe. To Madeline, from my perspective, there was no higher mission, no greater honor than to serve this great experiment of freedom known as the United States of America. May her memory continue to be a blessing to our nation, and may we remember her words and her deeds. May she always be a light to all those in the darkest places, a reminder of our obligation to one another. May God bless Madeleine Albright. Thank <laughs> you. 
Ann, Alice, Katie, to all the spouses, the grandchildren, Sister Kathy and Brother John, thank you for giving Hillary and me the chance to say a few words. Mr. President, President and Mrs. Obama, Vice President Gore, all the members of Congress and the diplomatic corps and cabinets past and present, and especially to all of you who had the distinct honor and I hope the joy of working with Madeleine Albright. Our last conversation was two weeks before she passed away. And we always spent the first few minutes telling stories that we swore were true and joking with each other. And, and then I said, tell me how you're feeling. She said, look, I've got a little problem here, but I've got a perfectly good doctor. I'm doing exactly what he tells me to do. So I'm getting good care, and whatever happens will be the best outcome I can get. Let's don't waste any time on that. The only thing that really matters is what kind of world we're going to leave to our grandchildren. I will never forget that conversation as long as I live. It was so perfectly Madeline. Yeah, I'd like to live to be 90, 95, 100. But the thing that really matters is what's going to happen to our grandchildren's generation? Are we going to lose our freedom? Are we going to lose our democracy? Have we decided, after all, that all that matters are our differences in this fleeting life instead of what we have in common? And so, Madeline made a decision that with her last breath, she would go out with her boots on. In this case, supporting President Biden and all of America's efforts to help Ukraine. What kind of world are we going to leave to our grandchildren? That question's kind of up in the air, but not because of Madeleine Albright. 
I was honored to be part of her life for more than 30 years. I was thrilled when uh, Chelsea got to meet her and what an influence she had on Chelsea and uh, lots of other young women. I was amazed by the friendship she formed with Hillary and grateful for that. But I met her a long time ago. She was working in the new caucus campaign, and I, um, I'm a graduate of Georgetown where she taught, so I knew her by reputation, and I knew she'd been voted the best teacher by the students twice. But when I finally met her, I realized that she was even better than advertised. She was smart, tough-minded, talented. She had a great sense of humor and a clear grasp of the post-Cold War world we were moving into. And so when I was elected, I asked Madeline to manage the transition for the National Security Council, which wound up filled with incredibly gifted, balanced people, and we had more problems than we could say grace over, and we needed every one of them. And as I watched her more, uh, I decided to ask her to be the ambassador to the United Nations because her life story was about to become the story of the last part of the 20th century and much of the world, and because she could be the voice of America at its best. And after four years in which she <laughs> continued to defy expectations and sometimes <laughs> raise eyebrows, Now, if I have to say this, she would never forgive me if I didn't mention this at her funeral. When the Cubans shot down the Brothers to the Rescue planes in violation of international law, they had a conversation which Madeline got a copy of on, the, on their radios between the planes about how they had shown their cojones by shooting down a totally defenseless couple of planes that were dropping pro-democracy leaflets in Cuba. And parenthetically, then almost certainly outside Cuban airspace when they were shot down, but it was illegal to do it in an airplane. So Madeline says, that's not cojones, that's cowardice. And all of a sudden, it was on the lips of everybody in South Florida. And, uh, and she was being criticized. Some people said, it's so undiplomatic, it's unladylike in South America. It's all this, on this, on that. And I called her and I said, I'm just jealous. It's the best line developed, <laughs> delivered by anybody in this administration since I've been here. <laughs> and keep on going. And, it was great. We spent a happy day together. Two years ago in Kosovo, 20 years after the conflict there, freed them of a genuine threat of genocide. We walked hand in hand through Pristina on a sunny, sunny June day. Down the street, there were about a quarter of a million people there. It's a lot of people in a small country like that. And uh, we came to the subject of our stroll, which was a beautiful bust of Madeline in a shrub surrounded tall stand that was their tribute to her for being there for them. We see that legacy honored. All the things she did with Kosovo, with Bosnia, we see it in so many ways. Today, 
we have the president, the prime minister, and the former president of Kosovo here. We have the foreign minister of Bosnia and Herzegovina. It took us until the slaughter of Srebrenica, but finally we got enough people together to do what's now being done in a different way to try to save Ukraine. From the day she entered the UN till the day she left, she tried to stick up for people who were left out and left behind. And in spite of all of its imperfections, and we all know them, I'm very grateful that the peace is held in Bosnia for now more than 26 years. We see her legacy honored here by the presence of the Vice President of Colombia, where Madeleine believed being a good neighbor was dealing with a country that was the oldest democracy in South America, where a third of the land was then under the control of the narco-traffickers with Plan Colombia. And just a few years later, the 50th anniversary of the Inter-American Development Bank was held in Medellin, formerly the drug capital of the world. She believed in that. She believed in the integrity of the, all the former republics of the Soviet Union. And I believe the president of Georgia is here today, and I'm very grateful for that. I'm grateful that she was an aggressive voice supporting Vice President Gore when we were trying to sound the alarm on climate change. And uh, we didn't always win, in case you didn't notice. Uh, for example, when Al flew to Japan to get the Kyoto Accord, the first ever international agreement on climate change, the Senate voted against it 98 to nothing before he got off the airplane home. But Madeline thought it was the right thing to do, and she kept banging the drum. And I think time has proved her out. The Secretary of State's job, as I came to learn firsthand, is a traveling job. I was fortunate to travel many miles with her. When I first heard that she passed away, the very first thing I did, I was home in New York, was to go into the kitchen and look at these two beautiful paintings from Haiti that Madeline gave Hillary and me because she knew how much we cared about what happened there. And there are just so many things that I remember. I remember that in addition to Colombia, she was always interested in Argentina, not only because they were a very strong ally of the United States, but because when I went on the state visit there and she went with me, uh, I went into, uh, with Hillary, we went into a dance hall in downtown Buenos Aires, and there was Madeline dancing a mean tango. <laughs> the rest of us were looking for lessons. Mad <laughs> she was looking for the dance floor. She was always about a half a step ahead on a lot of these things that matter a lot. I'm saying this all because she was a really fully developed woman. I mean, her life was a, sort of a microcosm of the late 20th century in Europe and the United States. Her family was run out of their home first by Hitler and then by Stalin. She came to America still not knowing the true story of her family and what they had done to survive. She was, after she was Secretary of State, she finally learned that she was actually raised Jewish and had three of her four grandchildren, grandparents, die in the Holocaust. But somehow in the middle of all that, we gave an distinguished Czech diplomat and his family 
a chance to come to America as refugees. And their daughter wound up uh, becoming ambassador to the UN and secretary of state and doing lots of other good things. She made us laugh, she made us cry, some of us she made mad. But she had a full, hopeful life because she knew what she believed in, she knew what she was for, she knew what she was against. And she wanted other people to feel the same way and then to talk about it instead of kill each other over it. That's basically her simple political philosophy. Today we see in Ukraine all too tragically what Madeleine always knew, that the advance of freedom is neither inevitable or permanent, and that in politics, where the lure of power is strong and the temptation to abuse it is often irresistible, there are no permanent victories or defeats. Her book on fascism was one of many she wrote. I personally love the one she wrote comparing the relationship of religion and politics in different countries. She just was curious. I want you to remember that. She was a great Secretary of State. She did 20 other things I could mention. But the most important thing is God gave her a fine mind, a wealth of experience for anybody who was willing to pay attention to it, and she made the most of it, not just for herself, but for other people. She loved this country more than you will ever know. And one of my proudest sad moments was when we went together to Vaclav Havel's funeral. And I believe that his wife, Dagmar, and high officials of the Czech government are here today, too. Madeline spoke for the United States. And we were in the National Cathedral. It was freezing cold. And Madeline got up and started mourning and paying tribute to her friend in their native tongue. The impact on the audience was electric. She spoke about five languages, I think, four more than I do anyway. Some would say five, but anyway, <laughs> she, she, the impact was electric. And I kept thinking, this is what America is about. that a hardworking immigrant family could come here and it could come to this. So I ask you, Madeline said once that we can't just be actors, we have to be authors of our own history. She was a great author, but will people read, remember, follow? This is what she would want me to say today. I had a good life. I was happy. I was so blessed in my family and my work and friends. But freedom and democracy and the rule of law are not permanently enshrined just because we've survived 200 plus years. Now, think about the world you want for your grandchildren and work for it. We love you, Madeline. We miss you. But I pray to God we never stop hearing you. Just sit on our shoulder and nag us to death till we do the right thing. God bless you.
Thank you. <clears throat> President Biden, President and Mrs. Obama, President Clinton, Vice President Gore, Secretaries of State, members of the Cabinet, members of Congress, and friends from literally around the world gathered on this glorious day in this magnificent cathedral to celebrate the extraordinary life and service of Madeleine Corbel Albright. To Madeleine's beloved family, her brother John and sister Kathy, her daughters Anne, Alice, and Katie, her sons-in-law, her six grandchildren, thank you for sharing her with us all of these years. Madeline and I bonded over many things, but in recent years, we bonded over the joy of being grandmothers. Nothing made her light up like talking about all of you, or, as Bill has said, made her more determined to help build a better, freer, safer world. That mission, which animated her entire life, never wavered. In her last memoir, she shared the urgency that she always felt. She wrote, there is no shortage of worthwhile work to be done and no surplus of seasons in which to do it. That is the wisdom of a woman who learned too early in life that life is fragile, freedom can't be taken for granted, democracy must be defended, peace must be won, and there is no time to waste doing any of that. It is the resolve of the refugee who fled tyranny twice before the age of 11. And it is the determination of a diplomat who knew war and worked to end it. I was privileged to know Madeline through many seasons of our lives and she was always in a hurry to do good. We first met in the 1980s at a benefit for the Children's Defense Fund here in Washington. She introduced herself as a fellow Wellesley College graduate, and the seeds of our friendship were sown. We called each other 59 and 69, she was 10 years ahead of me in college, but in some ways, it might have been a different century altogether. 
The commencement speaker, when she graduated from Wellesley, a former Secretary of Defense, told the class of 1959 that their main responsibility was to get married and raise interesting children. Now, Madeline did that, of course. But instead of resting on her maternal laurels, or even resting while her newborn twins were in the neonatal intensive care unit, she decided, presciently, it was time to learn Russian at the local college. Later, as a professor herself, she inspired her students to share her spirit of urgency and action. Silence may be golden, she told them, but it won't win many arguments. You have to interrupt. This came in handy when Bill named her ambassador to the United Nations in 1993 and then Secretary of State in 1996. Now, it's been said that I urged my husband to nominate her as our first female Secretary of State. Unlike much that's said, this story is true. <laughs> and I was thrilled when he agreed. When dictators dragged their feet or ambassadors filibustered, Madeline never hesitated to speak up. And just in case they didn't get the message, she would put on a snail pin to signal her impatience. A dozen times a day, she would ask her team, what's next? turning her boundless energy and intellect to yet another crucial global challenge. She was irrepressible, wickedly funny, very stylish, and always ready for a laugh. She brought the same energy to her friendships as she did to her diplomacy. Yes, it's true. She did teach the foreign minister of Botswana, the Macarena, at a UN Security Council meeting and snuck off early from an official event to do the tango in Buenos Aires. She was even invited to compete on Dancing with the Stars after she tore up the dance floor at Chelsea's wedding in the arms, I would add, of a much younger, very handsome man. She guest starred on TV shows like Gilmer Girls and Madam Secretary. In fact, she and Colin Powell of Blessed Memory and Madeline and I were on that series, which we all three loved and actually watched. And Madeline was always making a point to the scriptwriter. That would not have happened. <laughs> and finally, Colin said to her, Madeline, it's fiction. It's a story. She said, I know, but I want them to get it right. She took me on a memorable walking tour of her beloved Prague in the midst of a driving rainstorm which left us both laughing so hard we hardly noticed. And we spent a memorable evening together at the home of President and Mrs. Havel, just the four of us having dinner. And I got to listen to them talk about what it meant for their beloved country to be free. She met regularly with a group of former foreign ministers who were known as Madeline and her exes. 
And yes, I just want to make it clear, she really could press, leg press, 400 pounds. When that first came out, there were doubters. Anyone who knew Madeline didn't, but not everyone had that great pleasure. And so she made it very clear by going to her gym as soon as the article came out to do it again so that people would know, yes, she did. And she mentored the next generation of women leaders through Vital Voices, an organization that she and I helped to start back in the late 90s, and the Albright Institute at her beloved Wellesley College. She relished her annual journey north to Wellesley outside of Boston each winter to meet with the Institute's fellows. They came from all corners of the globe to hear from experts, to think critically about our biggest challenges, and to prepare for central roles in solving them. And very often she would call me when she returned with just such enthusiasm in her voice about the young women that she had just spent time with and what they were going to do in the future. She led the American delegation to the historical UN Conference on Women in Beijing in 1995, and she urged me to push the envelope on women's rights in the speech I delivered there. She also came with us the next day, about 45 minutes outside of Beijing, to where the non-governmental organizations and the activists had been sent, and where we, in the midst of a driving rain, another driving rain with me and Madeline, waded through the mud, trying to avoid the security from the Chinese government, who were not happy that Madeline and I were there, in order to speak to those women who would go home across the world to spread the message that women's rights are human rights. She never blinked. She just pulled herself up to her full height, which I never believed was five feet. But however high it was, she took every inch and every part of her spine was as straight as a steel bar and just looked at the security people and said, get out of our way. We're going to our meeting. She didn't just help other women. She spent her entire life counseling and cajoling, inspiring and lifting up so many of us who are here today. So the angels better be wearing their best pins and putting on their dancing shoes because if, as Madeline believed, there's a special place in hell for women who don't support other women, they haven't seen anyone like her yet. And yes, on top of all that, she continued to issue blunt warnings about the dangers posed by authoritarianism and fascism with undeniable moral clarity. Until the end, she was still in a hurry to do good. As Bill said during the last phone call, two weeks before she died, she talked about the importance of what President Biden is doing to rally the world against Putin's horrific invasion of Ukraine and the urgent work of defending democracy at home and around the world. She knew better than most, and she warned us in her book on fascism that, yes, it can happen here and time and courage are of the essence. 
The Bible tells us that to everything there is a season and a time and purpose under heaven, a time to weep and a time to laugh. If Madeline were here with us today, she would also remind us this must be a season of action. And yes, once again, we must heed the wisdom of her life and the cause of her public service. Stand up to dictators and demagogues, from the battlefields of Ukraine to the halls of our own capital. Defend democracy at home just as vigorously as we do abroad. Live up to the ideals of the country that welcomed an 11-year-old refugee sailing into New York Harbor on a ship called SS America and made her Secretary of State. Let us honor Madeline's life and legacy by being the indispensable nation she loved and served. And let us live as she did, in a hurry to do the most good we can with every season under heaven. Godspeed, 59. God bless you, dear Madeline. We will never, ever forget you. And we've been watching the funeral for former Secretary of State Madeleine Albright at the Washington Cathedral. We just there heard from former Secretary of State and Senator Hillary Clinton. Earlier, President Joe Biden and former President Bill Clinton also delivered eulogies for the trail-breaking diplomat. And to continue watching the service, you can head over to cbsnews.com slash now.